Hello, my name is Drew Velo Melchizedek, and uh, I'm about to tell you a story, a very long and beautiful story, about something that hardly anyone knows about it on, on Earth today. Uh, we've chosen this place of Sedona, Arizona, uh, in the United States, because this is where the story ends, is right here. But there's a long time before we get to the end to understand what is about to be talked about. So late last year we did another presentation called the Maya of Eternal Time. This was on the Mayan prophecy that there was going to be a physical pole shift on the earth, a huge earth change, transformation of the earth. And that simultaneously with that, uh, the Mayans also are predicting that there's going to be an equally huge change in human consciousness. That, uh, that we are going to change very rapidly, almost instantaneously, either during or before uh, or soon afterwards after this pole shift takes place. Uh, so this story now that we are going to talk about, it's still timed to the same timing that the Mayans are talking about, the procession of the equinoxes, uh, the last 26,000 years. It's still in the same time frame, the same everything, except this story is going to focus on this human change this human, human consciousness change that we're all about to go through. However, instead of uh, it being from a Mayan perspective, which they are the timekeepers of the world, it will not come from there. It will come from ancient Egypt uh, because they are the ones, uh, going back further in time, they are the ones that uh, actually originated all of this work uh, that we're about to talk about. So it's from, this, from the ancient Egyptian point of view that we will look through their eyes to see this uh, to, uh, to see and to understand this story that we're about to give to you. This story, as I started to say, is, is something that very few people on earth know. Uh, there are secret groups uh, like the Masons and uh, the Ascended Masters and uh, the Sufis, certain groups of Sufis uh, the Buddhists, Tibetan Buddhists, they're also familiar with what we're talking about. And there are a few groups in Hinduism that also understand. But most of the religious groups have no idea what we're about to talk about. And most of the world doesn't know. However, science is just beginning to understand. And so uh, this is something you may not know. And so, uh, so you have to hang in there with me because this is... Uh, an unusual subject to begin to speak about. This is not something that you are learning. Uh, you already know this information. It's in your heart. And you know it very, very well. It's just that you have forgotten what it is. And so, uh, everything we are about to do is not to teach you, but to trigger your own memories so that you can remember what we're talking about. Because you have lived through this a long time ago. And you know what we're talking about. And so, please keep in mind and, and, and allow yourself to be able to make changes within yourself as you watch this film. Otherwise, you're really going to miss the deeper secret aspect of what this is all about. The story began in a place called Atlantis. Yes, I know that science is not certain that Atlantis ever existed, even though people in history like Plato uh, said that it did. They've never found any evidence to prove that it actually sank below the ocean waves. But there are remnants of people that are alive today that do remember. Uh, the Hopi, for example, uh, they remember, and they have told me personally, that they used to live on Atlantis. And I've been in South America, in Colombia, to uh, the uh, Kogi, the Arawakos, the Wiwas, and the Kanguamos. And they also remember that they used to live in, in Atlantis, and they have told me directly that they have lived there. I even met uh, a, a Mongolian shaman uh, recently who said that they remember that they used to be in Atlantis. And so uh, there are people alive that remember, and they remember a long ways back. The Mayans tell me uh, they were another tribe. The Mayans also have told me, the modern-day Mayans, they also have said that they used to live in Atlantis. We have documentation that they used to live in Atlantis from a long time ago, according to the Toronto document. 
but uh, which is just stones showing uh, the ancient city of Atlantis and how it started to sink and, and the volcanoes were going off and how uh, they um, got into boats and rowed from, there, from where they were uh, into the Yucatan. And, uh, and this was from a long time ago, but they still remember today that they were from there. And so uh, we do have living people that remember this and, and it, is, it is these people that uh, we are drawing most of this information from, as well as the ancient Egyptians, who have actually been in this area here. Uh, I know it's not in our history, but this is another story for another time. But they have been here. In fact, they have been back over here in Boynton Canyon and into the Grand Canyon. And so, beginning with Atlantis, uh, this was a time in our history where we had developed uh, consciously to a very high level, a level of awareness beyond anything that we assume that is even possible for humankind. But we were there. Uh, we had broken the bonds with uh, gravity. We were able to levitate and to move in ways, uh, like I said, it, it just, it's hard to believe. But we had reached this high level of, of consciousness. However, that was only a small group of them. It was probably less than a thousand people that had actually reached that. Most of the uh, people there were in a level of consciousness similar to what we are in now. And in between those people, the ordinary people of Atlantis and these very high level beings were the Maya. And it was the same name. Uh, and they remember that's what they did. They were the translators between this very high level of consciousness and the ordinary people. They were the priesthood the ones that uh, translated through ceremony what, the, what was being told by the, this inner group of very high beings to the ordinary people out in Atlantis. Everything was going fine for a very, very long time until about 4,000 years before uh, this happened, a comet came out of the, a meteorite came out of the uh, atmosphere and just missed the western shores of Atlantis uh, it, it would, which is now the eastern shores of the United States. And it, it, it broke into three pieces. This is science, knows all of this. It broke into three pieces and went into the ocean and made these three huge holes right on the edge of, of Atlantis. And, uh, and the meteorite, the pieces from that, are spread all over the, western, the eastern shores of the United States and, and down into the ocean around there. Well, this created the, this unstabilized their continent. It left them really on the edge of a huge abyss. And so, 4,000 years later, or 13,000 years ago from now, uh, that's when we had another pole shift. And when we had that pole shift, uh, the continent couldn't withstand the pole shift and it sank into the ocean. This is uh, the best we could tell right now, this is what happened. But these people, uh, these very high-level beings, uh, they, they knew this was going to happen. They knew at least 200 years before they knew their continent was going to sink, and they prepared for this. And, uh, and in that preparation, one of these groups, a very small group of them, uh, which were perhaps misguided what, for whatever the reason, they built a pyramid made out of stone, a very large one. And uh, that pyramid sits off the coast of Bimini right now, uh, down deep into the ocean. And, uh, and they built this pyramid, and inside of there, they, they included, a, for us, a new technology. It's called the Merkaba. It's around human beings, but you can actually put it into a, a stone or to uh, electronics, any way that you want. And they created this, like, this, this technology inside of this pyramid, their purpose was not uh, very good. Uh, they actually wanted to control the continent of, of Atlantis and eventually to control the entire world. And, uh, but it had been a very long time since they had actually done this. And so they didn't really know exactly how to do it and they lost control of this pyramid. Uh, it was horrible what took place. Uh, it, it split open the dimensional levels between the third and the fourth dimension. It exposed human beings to uh, a level of consciousness and awareness that we're not prepared for. And it, it allowed beings from other levels of existence to come in here. 
that went into other people at that time. And it was painful, and it ended up being uh, a disaster on, a, on, a, on the biggest level you can imagine. And so for the last, uh, at least the last couple hundred years of Atlantis, uh, they were in pain. It was, it was terrible. Everybody was sick, and they were dying. These, this group of very high-level beings, they decided that they had to do something, and they went into uh, a, a connection with our own, con our own galaxy and got permission to do something that is very rare. Uh, since we had already reached this high level of consciousness, we had obtained it naturally, they decided or got permission to be able to do something to help us to get back to that level of consciousness. Now, normally that's illegal. You can't, uh, throughout the universe, you can't interfere with the other forms of consciousness. You have to leave them alone and let them naturally do whatever they're going to do. But because we had reached this level, we got permission to do something very unusual. And it's going to take me a while to explain it to you because this is outside of our normal way of thinking. So there were three men that uh, became paramount in this whole story. Uh, they were the ones out of this small group of highly intelligent beings who knew that we were going to fall, uh, knew that we were going to uh, drop in consciousness, and, and they were the ones that engineered, conceived of, uh, a, a plan or an idea of how to bring this back to us. Uh, their names, one of them was Chikutet Arlich Vomalites, the other one was Ra, and the other one was Ararat. And these three men were ascended masters. Uh, they no longer died any longer. They had figured that one out a long time ago. Uh, and they were also a part of the ascended masters uh, of that same group that, w that people refer to today, but they're older ones. They were ones that have been around for a very long time. And what they decided to do was something that is tried throughout the universe occasionally. Uh, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, uh, it's just the, the, the race of beings on that planet have to just start all over again. And that is usually hundreds of thousands of years of evolution have to be done all over again. And so they began this process of, of returning our consciousness to us by building a building. And they built this building in an area relative to Atlantis at that time that was completely uninhabited out in the middle of nowhere by most people's standards. Uh, they chose this place for a very specific reason, which I'll talk about in a little while later but it is the place that we now call Egypt. And this building that I'm referring to is the Great Pyramid in Egypt. This was, uh, they built this uh, before the sinking of Atlantis. They had to get it in place first because this building was more than just a building. It was also the marking uh, for the entire system that we're about to talk about. But uh, according to them, it was built through consciousness and it was built very, very rapidly in a matter, really, of hours. And, uh, and it was built, even more crazy, it was built from the top down. From the top stones down to the bottom. When I presented this information to the Egyptian government back in the 90s, uh, they thought I was crazy too. And so, but they went and checked it to see, and they checked the mortar in between the stones uh, from the top to the bottom and found out that the oldest stones were on the top and the youngest ones were on the bottom. They couldn't explain it, they didn't know what to say about it, but they couldn't contradict what I was saying. Now to understand this a little bit further, uh, it wasn't just from this one building that they were going to bring back our consciousness uh, or, this, or from the Great Pyramid. That was just the beginning. It was actually a, a web of pyramids and temples and, and, uh, and uh, sacred sites, uh, churches, all kinds of buildings, even mosques, everything, along with specific mountains and lakes and rivers that were uh, attuned to this. It was a web of these buildings all over the world. 83,000 of them all over the whole world were to be built uh, over time. And, and in doing that, uh, they were going to change the way the earth functions. 
these these buildings uh, what 's so interesting about them is that they were built over thirteen thousand years, but the entire structure was created in a matter of hours, not on this dimension but on the fourth dimension on the higher fre- frequencies of the earth 's uh, consciousness, they built the entire thing, and they did that through consciousness in the same way they built the first first one from the top down and and so once all these buildings were created on that other level, they slowly began to pull them out of the fourth dimension onto the thir- third dimension and These buildings were built by normal means; they were built by different tribes like the Mayans and the Yucatan or in China or in Japan. Japan has over a hundred pyramids uh, running down their, their islands. Uh, all over the world, in Tibet and, and Mongolia. Mongolia has some of the most amazing pyramids on earth, if it, and hardly anyone even knows about this stuff. But they're all over. And, uh, and this was the beginning of something, uh, of, a, of an ancient science that we know a little bit about now, it's a science called geomancy. What were they doing by building these pyramids and temples and all these structures all over the world? What were they doing by doing this? Well, it was a very deep level of what today, in modern times, they call geomancy. And what is geomancy? Geomancy is a modern term, more or less. Uh, I'm sure they had another name for it. But it is, it is what it is, is using uh, uh, stones, rocks, crystals. Uh, it in modern times, they use uh, brass, wires, different kinds of physical things to change the energy flow of the earth. Uh, it, it, and these buildings, when they're placed on very, very specific, precise places on the earth, Uh, They change the internal flow inside the earth and the external flow above the earth. Uh, And I'm talking about the way these kind of energies are energies that are created by uh, volcanoes, by tectonic plate pressures, by geopath lines and all kinds of internal structures. You can, by moving certain stones, massive stones like a Great Pyramid, when you build certain things in very specific places, it changes the way those energies flow. And they also changed the way the energies flow above the earth. And what they were doing by doing this in, in this way was to create a new consciousness grid. Uh, a, the grid that we lost in Atlantis by falling in that, con- literally the same fall that the Bible was talking about, by falling from a higher level of consciousness down to where we are now. Uh, they were changing this, influencing it, and creating a brand new one so that we could get back. Without this grid, Without the consciousness grid, which we haven't talked about yet or really explained, but without this grid that surrounds the entire Earth, we cannot get to this new, this new or old level of consciousness. We can't return to where we once were. It's impossible. You have to have that. And so all of these millions of people that had to uh, carve these stones and put them in place uh, and these 13,000 years of time were essential in order to, to do this kind of geomancy on a global level, also a new kind of grid could be formed around the external in space around the earth so that we can make a transformation at this time right now, today. If you go back 110 years ago to the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, at that time, they believed there were approximately 30 million species on Earth. Now, it took somewhere between 4.6 to 5 billion years, depending on who you talk to, for those 30 million species to develop and, and to be living on the surface of the Earth at this time. But in those 110 years, because of this level of consciousness that we are in now, we have killed these things. We are now down to approximately 15 million species on Earth. It depends on who you talk to. Everybody varies on, on how many, the number, but that's approximately what it is. Almost half of the life that's on Earth is now extinct. It's gone. It's never to be seen again, probably. If we can make it into the next level of existence, uh, all of this will, will end. It, we will be able to fix what took place over this last 110 years. 
if we do not return to this other level of consciousness, one of two things is going to take place. And, and almost all of the indigenous tribes that I've talked to around the world, they all agree with this. If we do not make it this time, up into this level of consciousness that we were before, then we will end up killing this planet, and we will kill all the life on it. We will destroy this place. And, uh, and so uh, it is up to you, and it is up to all of us now, to remember what this is all about and to make changes within ourselves so that we, we do not go extinct. Because if we do, it is the end of what, what everything that is, is started on this planet. It will go away. What needs to be understood is that each one of these species has a, uh, a, an electromagnetic geometrical uh, field that extends around the entire Earth. Uh, every one of them, and they're unique. Each one is completely unique. If there were only two insects on Earth, and, that, and that's the only two insects there were on the whole planet, they could not exist unless there was a consciousness grid around the planet uh, that surrounded the planet just for them. And, that, and the geometry of it would, would reflect exactly the geometry of their body. Uh, you, could, you could tell very quickly that those bugs came from that particular geometry. So out of these 15 million life forms that are left on Earth today, uh, there are three that are human. So we actually have three different kinds of human beings on Earth. Uh, they, they perceive the one reality in a different way. Uh, and the first one is the aboriginals, the original people on Earth. So the aboriginals in Australia, and there are the little pockets of them around the world that are still functioning on the original grid that came out of humanity a long, long time ago. And then there is the next grid, which is much more, as I, we really don't know very much about this grid geometrically, uh, what it looks like or form. There's been hard, almost no scientific research done on that at all. But on uh, our level, uh, the, the industrial world's level of consciousness, uh, we know quite a bit. Uh, this, uh, this grid is uh, believed to be a uh, rhombic uh, triachondrohedron, uh, which is a, a, a relationship between an icosahedron and a dodecahedron, but, uh, but a very specific angle of how they are connected together. And it was uh, the United States, we believe, who first scientifically discovered that this thing was actually around the world, uh, though Russia had a lot to do with it. And uh, we believe, we're not exactly sure, because so much of this is kept secret. And what we do know is that this grid that s goes around the world, it has places where the lines cross. And it's very interesting, very, very interesting, that most of the military bases in the world between Russia and the United States are located exactly on those nodal points. Uh, why would they do that? Because they knew that that was the consciousness grid of the entire planet and if they could control that grid, they can control all the people in the world. And so it's, ob it's an obvious military move to make, and, it, and they've known this for a very long time now. Uh, they, I think it went back into uh, probably the 60s when they first discovered this. There's also now a third grid. This is the grid that uh, Chikutet, Arlich, Vomalites, and Ra, and, and Ararat are uh, creating by making all these these uh, sacred sites all around the world and doing this geomancy, they are slowly forming around the earth. Every time they build a new one, it changes the shape a little bit and they keep getting it closer and closer and closer to a grid that is an icosahedron, dodecahedron blend perfectly at a very specific angle. Also, it's similar to the other one, but it's completely different. And this one was discovered by Russia. We do know that. And they, were, and they were the ones that first discovered that and, uh, and I'm sure have done massive research on, uh, on how that grid relates into the next level of consciousness because that's where we're going. Uh, without these grids, without this new grid that, that is being formed right now, uh, there would be no ascension. Uh, nobody would be able to move from where we are now and no one would ever be able to go into a higher level of consciousness until and that grid is completed and finished. And, uh, and so before that, uh, you could move to, uh, 
You could become a, an ascended master, but we could not move as, a, as an entire race, as an entire planet. We could not move until that's completed. The differences in these three consciousness, these three different ways of perceiving the reality, are tied to something that is called the golden mean. The golden mean is something that is in all life everywhere, though it's, it's not directly being done, it's done through the Fibonacci. This would take a while of study to understand this. The golden mean is a proportion. Uh, if you were to cut a stick at a certain place, it would be such that this point would be one, and this one would be 1.618339, and it would go on forever. It's an, an unending uh, uh, number. And, uh, but life is always trying to reach this number, and so is consciousness. Consciousness, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a relationship between the square and the circle. And when the perimeter of the square and the circumference of the circle are exactly the same, that's the golden mean. And, uh, but, we ne but we reach it in stages. And so the aboriginal grid uh, is very close to the golden mean. It's not perfect. It's, not, it's off a little bit but it is close. The grid that we are on, the, uh, the, this middle grid that we are on right now, it is not even close to being golden mean. It's so far off it's ridiculous and so we are not in tune with nature. That's obvious. This is why we're killing the planet. Uh, this, is, this is meant to be a, a transition state between the aboriginal state and the next higher level of consciousness. We're meant to come here spend a few moments and get on with it and go on to another level because we can't stay here because anybody that stays in this state of consciousness very long will kill any planet that they're on because they are not connected to nature. The next level that we're going to is more harmonic than the uh, aboriginal state. It is, it is a much closer uh, golden mean ratio uh, consciousness and, uh, and if we can just make it to that place then we can solve all of our problems. It will, be, it will just happen pretty much automatically. So this second grid uh, is based on what we call polarity consciousness. Uh, it's got different names uh, around the world, but it, it simply means that we see everything as either black or white. We constantly are judging every situation. Every person we see, we judge them as good or bad. And this is uh, the nature of polarity consciousness. It is a problem on one level, uh, because it creates ego in the mind. It, it thinks only of itself. It doesn't think of other people, except in people we love or close to us, but people that are a distance from us, it, it doesn't care about them. It only cares about itself. And that's, and that's the level of consciousness that we're in now. Normally, uh, these consciousness grids are created naturally. Uh, people live over hundreds of thousands of years and they evolve over those periods of time and in so doing they slowly create the, from the grid that they're in they, they automatically create the next grid through a natural process but because we arrived at this once before we're being allowed to reach this but to reach it synthetically uh, we're through creating pyramids and buildings and structures and temples all over the world this is a synthetic way of doing this, uh, and, uh, and, and you need to understand that this is what is going on. It is synthetic. Uh, we're being given a second chance at all of this. It, it's all been synthetic, right even from the beginning. If you go back even into Egypt, uh, they were using pyramids there, and they were using pyramids to raise it. They used frails and rods and, and uh, hooks and all these other kinds of things that they used to put on the spines to tune them to the higher levels of consciousness. It was purely synthetic. And, and everything that has been going on for the last 13,000 years has been synthetic to get us to this place. And once we're on it, all that will not be of, of any use anymore because then once we're on that and we're, we're back onto that consciousness grid, we can go on our own without anybody's help. We'll be able to continue on from there on. I guess there's another little uh, piece that we should uh, explain. Uh, I talked about these three men, Chikitet, Arlich, Vomalites, Ra, and Ararat. Well, the first one, Chikitet, Arlich, Vomalites, uh, he was the king of Atlantis for a very long time. According to the Emerald Tablets, which was written 2,000 years ago, he was ascended master. He had lived there for 52,000 years, believe it or not. When it came time to be for Egypt, uh, he changed his name to Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. 
Thoth was in, in Egypt, he was the scribe, the person who wrote down history. Uh, since he lives for so long, he just kept writing it down. And so everything that I've learned from this pretty much was originally from Thoth. However, uh, his wife was Shizat, and she was also a scribe. Uh, she was equally writing down the history. And, and this is something I, I think that uh, people need to understand. Uh, almost all of modern history was written by men. And the women were just, uh, their ideas of what took place were just dropped out. But in Egypt, that never took place. Uh, Thoth wrote down his ideas of what he believed, ha his observations and what he saw, and his wife what, wrote down her observations. They did not correspond at all the times. They saw things differently. They were like a coin with a heads and a tail. Uh, and one side was male and one side was female. And really, to really know history and to understand history, you must have both the male and female point of view or you do not get a full picture of what really took place. Now we need to add another piece to all of this so it begins to make more sense. And you can begin to see that this is just not fantasy, but this is science and mathematics. There was a man named Carl P. Munch who uh, discovered something incredible. And this was toward the end of uh, last century, I think, maybe, maybe even as early as the 1980s. But he discovered that when you go to uh, any of these pyramids and churches and uh, temples uh, around the world, that they have a code written on the outside of the building. You don't even have to go inside. It's, it has to do with the shape, with the number of steps, and, the, and the, a lot of different forms that are on the outside of these things. Uh, you can go onto his website if you wish to uh, understand uh, what he's talking about in detail. And this is just a review of his work, by the way. This is, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. I'm only going to just give a review of it. So each one of these pyramids, when you look at them, or buildings, will, from the external view of it, will pr pr if you know how to read this code, will produce these series of three numbers. And these three numbers tell you exactly. It's the longitude, la latitude. Of, of a grid, not the one we're using today, but a, a one, an ancient one. And uh, those uh, numbers, uh, in order to arrive at that precision where every single one of those 83,000 sites are precisely on Earth, to arrive at that, uh, we would normally imagine that they would have to be in space and have satellites, uh, a GPS system like, like we have today. I mean, how could they do this? But what his work has shown is that this is true, that these codes that are coming out of these pyramids are real and, and actually do delineate. But in order to understand what the system is, you have to look at something very interesting. Ra and Ar Aragat and Chikatet Arledge Fomalites, they knew where the new poles were going to be and they knew what the new uh, equator was going to be, which is the one we have now. They knew that before, uh, at least 200 years before it actually happened. They calculated that, however they did that. But the, pr the prime meridian that we use today is not the one he uses. The one that Thoth is using is the Great Pyramid itself. If you take the North Pole and the South Pole and run a line directly over the apex of the Great Pyramid, that is the prime meridian of this system. And uh, which makes sense, it's the first building that was built. And furthermore, that first building wasn't just placed anywhere on Earth. It happens to be the precise center of the entire landmass of the Earth. Uh, they knew that even if you couldn't find that building for some reason, that uh, that spot is not going to move more than a few inches over 13,000 years. Uh, there's another thing about Carl's work that's uh, pretty interesting. Uh, it was introduced into the United Nations, uh, and the whole system of all of this was uh, given to them. and. Uh, exactly how it works and uh, and this uh, the uh, the new uh, system that they had found and everything and how this all all these pyramids were all around the world were connected to it and uh, but they didn't know what to do I mean it, it defies everything that modern man knows about ancient man uh, this put this makes ancient man on almost the same level that we're on and and how could this possibly be uh, but they couldn't deny it either because there it was. It was mathematical fact. 
and uh, and so it's been kind of just shoved under the floor of the somewhere in the United Nations has been put under a carpet somewhere and just forgotten because it didn't fit into anything that we know and so what I'd like to do now is just to uh, read to you uh, directly from Carl's work uh, uh, his what, some of w what he has found to be true and then you'll begin to understand this I was trying to develop a code system to be based on the language of latitude and longitude, degrees, minutes, and seconds. The idea being to multiply the three numbers in each set to a single number, 15 degrees times 15 minutes times 01.6000 seconds, products at 360, the number of degrees of an arc in any circle. For example, when I divided 360 degrees constant by 19 degrees, 18 minutes, to 01.052631578926 seconds, I found myself on the parallel of latitude which crosses the Mexico's round 360 degrees Kiwikuliko pyramid just south of uh, Mexico City. But later, when probing the larger 21,600, the number of nautical miles in the Earth's polar circumference, I found that when I divided it down through 51 degrees and 10 minutes, to 42.3529411 seconds, it crossed the exact center of England's Stonehenge, another round 360 degree monument, which originally had 60 stones around its perimeter, as 60 stones times 360 degrees multiplies to exactly 21,600. Problem is, these pyramid grid scenarios kept coming. Egypt's El Kula Pyramid at 36, its bent pyramid of Sinafu, 180, the Druid Mound in Massachusetts, 180, the Earthen Ideogram Fort at Newark, Ohio, 2160, the Temple of the Atlantis at Tula in Mexico, 2880, the Giza Sphinx at 5400, Georgia's Kolomoliki Mound, 7200, Ohio's Seep Mound, 8,640, Mississippi's Emerald Mound, and the Red Pyramid of Sanufu at Darshu, uh, 10,800, the Great Triangle drawn on the plains of Nazca in Peru, 17,280, and Germany's Golo Earth Circle near Bond, 27,000. The eye and the mile-long face at Poverty Point, Louisiana, 32,400, the organ vortex, 48,600, Manos, another drawing on Nazca's plains, 64,800, and North Bimini's shark mound, and the pyramid at the magicians at Ushmal, 129,600, all of which are divisible by 360. Now that you've heard Munch's words, you begin to understand uh, that there is this precision grid of 83,000 sites all over the world that are precisely put on the planet, precisely in very specific places, and that it was not possible that this could have been done by all these indigenous tribes like the Mayans or the Egyptians or the Chinese, etc., but rather it had to be a single mind, a single thought, uh, a single plan to do this. There is no other way. And this changes the whole understanding of history and who, and who we were before and who we are now. And so now you can see what uh, Chiquitet Arlich Vomalites and Ra and Ararat were doing. They were creating these structures all over the world to change the internal flow of the, of the Earth's uh, uh, energies, which is called geomancy, so that the external flow was altered and in so doing, slowly creating this electromagnetic field, that's the geometrical electromagnetic field that surrounded the Earth. And, uh, and, and in doing that, they were recreating our consciousness grid so that we would be able to ascend. This is a gift of love. Uh, it, it shows that uh, we are not alone in, in, in our, our uh, consciousness and what is going on with us in this world and that we have not been forgotten. Uh, they, they remember us and, they, and, and they're taking care of us. These are our ancestors. These are the old ones that are still connected to us now. They extend through all cultures and all levels of life, 
even down in German families and American families and, uh, and from South Africa or anywhere else. These are our ancestors doing something for us so that we can make a change. And in, and in making this change, we do something for them. We bring them back. We'll explain this later. Now, with that background, with that uh, knowledge and that information, uh, we're going to begin to tell you the living side of all of this, the story that has unfolded around the world over the last uh, really probably 65 years or so. And so it, it took time. I mean, as, as uh, Atlantis sank and all the different uh, factors began to happen, uh, the pyramids started to be built continuously all around the world, especially after the first 6,000 years. It took that long. In the precession of the equinoxes, there was a point in there that we had to reach before uh, the pyramids and everything could really start to be built on a massive scale because humanity was not on a level that they could do those kinds of things. But eventually, after 6,000 years, we were ready. And so these pyramids started to be built here and there in China and Japan and uh, in the Yucatan and Guatemala and South America, uh, all over the world, in Russia. And, uh, and as this was going on, uh, each time one of these was built, the, the electronic grid around the Earth would take a little bit more geometrical form and, and become a little more uh, closer to what would be necessary for us to be able to connect to as a living thing. Um, progress all the way up until, um, say, about 65 years ago, uh, directly after uh, World War II. And then things began to happen on another level. We had other people began to become involved in what we were doing. Uh, only one year after uh, the World War II was over with, in 1946, the summer of 1946, uh, spaceships appeared all over Europe and every single military base there, almost without exception. The following year, in June of 1947, spaceships appeared all over the military bases all over the United States. How do I know this? because there's historical documents that most people haven't seen that proves that this is true. And this opened another doorway because now we began to get uh, extraterrestrials involved in the, this work of, the, of this grid besides uh, just the Ascended Masters and humanity. By uh, a little bit later in that, by the 1960s, we began to see crop circles in England we began to see crop circles that were not only in wheat and, and different kinds of crops, but we began to see ice circles where they were formed in ice and circles that were huge. And obviously, nobody had stepped on the ground at all. They were perfectly embedded in the ice. And we found thousands of these now. Then we found crop circles that were with trees in Canada where the trees were formed over. No human being could have done this either. And uh, though... We do know through Colin Andrews that about 80% of the crop circles were man-made. The other 20% are not uh, human, uh, at least uh, human as we know it, uh, uh, based uh, crop circles. This was another level of communication that began to take place around the world. It was important communication, but to this day we haven't really understood what they were saying. Uh, as we got closer up into about the 1980s, a phenomenon began to take place, and there was probably many of you watching this that may remember this. From about 1983, 4, all the way up, and maybe even, maybe even as early as 1980 or so, all the way up to about 1991, 1992, there were people all over the world, and I mean everywhere, that were sitting in meditation. They were mostly people that did do meditation. They were able to understand uh, subtle energies. And in their meditations, they were told that they had to take a crystal to some pyramid, some temple, somewhere in the world, and to program it in a certain kind of way and to place it there. Uh, we estimate at least 150,000 to 100 to 150,000 people were involved in this. And, and every time someone did, someone went to a certain temple like Chichen Itza in Mexico and placed a little crystal in a certain place that, where they were told to do, this 
affected the energy of the geomancy of that space just a tiny bit, which would then correct the geometries that were above the Earth. Uh, after probably a number of crystals that approached nearly a million crystals, uh, this had a dramatic effect on, on the, uh, the, the unity grid above the Earth. But by 1989, and this was, uh, this was documented from, uh, from the people that I work with at any rate, by 1989, the unity grid around the world was geometrically proper, meaning it was, it was, it was an icosahedron, pentagonal dodecahedron relationship. And, uh, and energy was moving through it and flowing through it for the first time. But it still was not perfect. There were still problems involved uh, in this, and more corrections needed to be made. By the mid-90s, uh, there was a small group of people. This number of people was probably less than 100 people. It, could, it was probably closer to 70 or 80 that were experts on subtle energies. And I was one of those. But only one. There were many, many, many other people that were just as important doing what they were doing on those levels. And, uh, and we were directed to go to very specific pyramids and to uh, make very specific changes. Uh, and not changes in the grid or by changing the, uh, the energies of the, of, the, uh, of the pyramids or the temples, but rather the indigenous people that lived in those areas had done things in their lifetime that had caused a distortion in the energetic body of the earth. Uh, we had to go into uh, the Anasazi at one point and make corrections in the Four Corners area where we are now because of what they did over uh, the, the years that they were involved. We then were involved with the Maya and uh, in uh, Guatemala and Belize and in that area down in there doing ceremony after ceremony after ceremony to uh, solve the problems of which they did, what they did a, uh, a long time ago. Uh, we then went into Peru with the Inca. And, and each time, by the way, we were invited to these places. We didn't just show up and say, hey, we want to do something here. Uh, each time, the people of that area would ask us to come there, and we would always accept it. And they knew exactly what we were doing and why we were doing it. The Incas appeared while we were in Mexico and said that the shamans wanted us in Peru. Uh, when, we, when they got there, though, they didn't just accept us. Uh, we had to show uh, by our actions and our energies uh, uh, signs that would come from within Mother Earth to prove that we were the people. Each time this was always the case. We, it didn't matter what we said. It was what Mother Earth said in our behalf. And, uh, and we passed every one of these tests and, and, and began to correct all these things. Uh, we went into New Zealand, uh, and uh, there is an, a, a very good uh, video that will be coming out very soon to show you what, how and what uh, this, these kinds of things uh, look like when they're in real life taking place. And then I wrote a book called The Serpent of Light. And, uh, and this book described the interaction of myself and other people I work with with approximately a little less than a thousand indigenous tribes in North and South America. Uh, this was about uh, the same energy times that the Mayans are talking about with the precession of the equinoxes of uh, the last 13,000 years and the last 26,000 years. Uh, the Serpent of Light talks about the Kundalini of the Earth moving from the western mountains of Tibet to the northern mountains of Chile. This was an extraordinary historical event that almost nobody on earth knew that was taking place, but it was huge, it was massive. And the, the energy comes from the center of the earth and finds a place. It comes out very much like a snake. That's why it was called the serpent of light. And when it, uh, when it finds, and it move, first it moves all over the world, moving from every single area of the earth. And then it finds a place and it coils down inside the earth and it stays there for the next 13,000 years. And this energy is the Kundalini. It wakens the people in that region who become the teachers of the world, just as they have been in, in India and Tibet for the last uh, many thousands of years. And, uh, but now that it has moved to the, in, to, uh, to the Andes, it, it will be the, Argen the Chileans, the Peruvians, the Argentinians, uh, countries like, as far away as Colombia and Brazil 
and uh, Ecuador. Uh, these energies are going to uh, awaken the souls there. But the, but the Kundalini was also aimed on the western side of the mountain out over the ocean so that it went out over the Polynesian world, out in, over to uh, Easter Island and to Morea and out further, all the way as far as New Zealand. And so there was, an, there was an awakening, a new awakening, a brand new spiritual energy that the world has never seen. And that energy moved into Chile in the year 2002. In 2003, or later 2002, I went to Chile and went to the mountains there to experience this energy directly. But I, I couldn't feel it. I couldn't feel anything. I was very confused. I really didn't know why uh, I couldn't feel anything. I came back home. I waited a year, a year and a half. I went back down there again to feel it. I felt absolutely nothing. And I didn't understand because I knew it was there. There was 112 tribes sitting in a circle waiting for it to come in when it, when it arrived. And they knew it was there, but it wasn't working, and I didn't know why. Then we received an invitation from the Arapa Nui, a tribe that lives on Easter Island in, out of Chile. And they wanted us to come and do ceremony with them. And it was followed by an invitation from the queen of the... Uh, the Polynesian Islands, uh, a woman, we will simply say Mama Lucy. And uh, she was the most important uh, female in the Polynesians. And she invited us to the island of Morea, which is the south pole of this grid. Now, this is something I didn't say, and I think I need to add this right now. The consciousness grid is just like the earth. It has an axis that runs through it. And the north pole and the south pole are very important points. The North Pole happens to be just outside of where the Great Pyramid is, only just a little ways away from it, about a mile and a half, which is nothing relative to the 25,000 miles of the Earth. And then it goes through the Earth and it comes out. Um, it, if you went straight through the Earth, you would come out on the ocean, but it doesn't. And there's a slight curve in it, and it comes out in an island called Morea. And this is where the South Pole is. And this is where Mama Lucy was, and she was inviting us to this place. And so we began a journey. And as we were instructed, we were to bring people from all over the world uh, to this place, and they were to represent the world. I don't even remember how many countries it was. It was about 14 or 17 countries that were involved in this with about 50, 55 people. And we all met in uh, Easter Island for the purpose of doing this kind of geomancy on the earth. And we were met there by the Arapa Nui, who before they could even talk to us or, or begin to do anything, they said that we had to do an initiation, a ceremony that was uh, to connect us closer in our hearts and so that we could work together. This was an ancient ceremony where they stripped down their clothes and put body markings on and uh, began to do the ceremony with each one of us in there. And we began to interact in the ceremony. Afterwards, we ate these meals with them and we connected in such a way that we could then proceed and go on from that time. We spent some time there getting used to the energies, getting to know the people, uh, having the Rapa Nui tell us things that they haven't told people in hundreds and hundreds of years telling us about their inner cities inside their tunnels uh, and knowing all this time the reason why we were there was to uh, do a correction. It, did, it wasn't until I was actually there that I began to understand. In fact, it wasn't until we started to do this correction uh, ceremony. They, they took us way out into this wooded area and told us that this is where the ceremony had to be. And as we were setting everything up, uh, the inner guidance that I follow uh, came in and explained to me why we were doing this ceremony right at the very, very last moment. And it had to do with the Arapa Nui. The Arapa Nui, at one point, uh, they destroyed all their trees and, and so that there was no more food, and they began to eat each other. They began cannibalism. And this cannibalism that they... Uh, created uh, on that island spread throughout the throughout the Polynesian islands and uh, and it was this cannibalism that we had to correct we it had to be forgiven and they had to forgive themselves uh, in this ceremony so that 
uh, what that would do is correct the, the, the geometry of the above the earth, above the island where we were, really. And that, in turn, would begin to allow the flow to really move through uh, this thing where it could then be born. And so when, we were, when I was actually taken to the ceremonial site by the Arapanui and were shown where it was, and I actually began to set up, the, the, putting the cloth on the ground, beginning to put the crystals and everything to arrange for the ceremonial process, it was then that I understood uh, why we were doing this ceremony. And, and this is important to understand. Um, the Kundalini of the Earth did not function because of this distortion that was directly above it uh, in the grid. And it was purposely done by the Ascended Masters and the people involved in this. They didn't want the Kundalini to begin to function before the consciousness grid was born. Uh, they need to work together. And so they got the Kundalini in place, but they had to hold it there for about six years until the grid was completed. And so then it all made perfect sense of why we were there and what we were doing. And so uh, we began this ceremony, and it was a ceremony that I had never seen before. Uh, according to the Rapa Nui, this ceremony had not been performed in anything similar to it for at least 13,000 years. And, uh, but that's their story, and I can't really uh, tell you uh, why they said that. And, uh, and so the ceremony began to unfold with both our group and the Rapa Nui uh, there. And then uh, uh, what it did was it corrected it, the forgiveness of the, of the, of the cannibalism w took place. The energy corrected itself. The grid formed perfectly around the earth for the first time ever. And, uh, and, we, and I felt like it was completed. I, I it felt in my heart, okay, this is done. And I ended the ceremony and, uh, and began to end it when something occurred that I did not expect, I had never seen before. Coming out of the sky came this spiraling energy of a golden light, which was coming off of the, the unity grid and came down like a tornado, only a soft, gentle tornado. And it came down and it swirled around right down to the earth where we were. Everyone in there had their experiences of this in different ways. Uh, I, we've spent a long time talking about this, but for me, uh, it was the most amazing feeling. I had the sensation that I was in the presence of, I would say, God, or some very high consciousness. Uh, it, it, it was relaxing. Every cell in my body relaxed, and this golden light just kept swirling around us. And you could actually look up into this tube that stretched high up into the sky. Uh, it lasted for what felt like maybe 10 minutes, and then it retracted and went back up into the sky. Uh, after the ceremony was over, I talked to the Arapa Nui, and I said, have you ever seen anything like this before? And they said, no, we don't know what that was. And I don't either. At least I didn't then. I understand much more now. But at that point, it, there's been no reference in any spiritual books or anybody that I have ever known, uh, any, any of my teachers anywhere that have ever talked about anything like this before. But what I did know was that our guidance was telling us that we had to hurry. We had to run. We had to pack everything up, get on a, a plane, and fly to Tahiti as fast as possible for the birthing of the grid. Now that it was full, it was complete, it, it was like a baby that was beginning to crown and was going to come out any minute. And, uh, and so everybody had to get ready as fast as possible. It, it had nothing to do with us. It was the baby was going to be born. And so we had to go really fast. And that's exactly what we did. We packed up everything. We threw everything. And then early the next morning, we got on a flight. We flew to Tahiti and, uh, and then proceeded immediately by getting on a boat and, and heading toward Morea. Uh, which was the south pole of this grid, so that we could be there for the birth of a brand new consciousness on Earth, something that has never happened on Earth before, and uh, in, in synthetically in this way. 
and uh, and a great excitement. It went through me. It went through everyone. We were just like a fire with excitement. And so now we're going to go into another ceremony, a ceremony that we consider to be the most sacred ceremony that has ever been performed on earth, ever. As we pulled into Tahiti, Tahiti is like, uh, <laughs> it's hard to believe that Tahiti actually exists if, you, if you've ever been there, because it's so beautiful. The mountains just stretch up to the sky. Uh, it is just in an incredible place. And we had just come from uh, Easter Island, which is dry and not much on there and everything and so all these people were used to that and as we pulled into the harbor it was one of the most beautiful scenes I've seen in my life they got so excited that everybody started clapping <laughs> because of the just the pure beauty of this place and from there uh, we were met by members of the Queen of Morea not the next day but two days later uh, we were taken to be before her now of course she wouldn't allow all 55 people or whatever it was to, to come there. So there was just myself and a woman named Ruth, Ruth Tive, who is a who is a Maori, a native Maori from New Zealand, who knew her language. And I felt like uh, she was the right person to be there. So the two of us went to meet with uh, the queen. The queen was a huge woman with this uh, very big heart. She was just pure love. And she knew exactly why we were there, that we were there to birth this new consciousness onto the earth and to do the ceremony for this. And she was also there with her, uh, another woman who was the, uh, her assistant directly underneath her. And uh, she opened us with open arms and hugs and, uh, and we began to talk. And, and very quickly into all of this, she said to me, where do you want to do the ceremony? Well, I said, uh, I, I, without thinking too much, uh, I said, well, I would like to do it in the center of the island. The reason I said that was because I was there in 1985, and I had to do ceremony with that, on that same island in 1985 with the same tribe, and they took me into the center of the island, and that's where we did the ceremony. It's in the Serpent of Light book, if you want to read that. And... Uh, and so I said, well, how about the center of the island? And she looked at me and she says, well, I, I can't do that. And we said, why? And she says, well, I don't have authority. I have authority everywhere, but not in the center of the island. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you that permission. And the person that was her assistant uh, jumps up, ran over to her and says, no, no, you don't understand. What's about to take place with the ceremony is one of the most important things that, on earth ever and just give him permission and we'll deal with everybody later on this. <laughs> and she said, no, I don't have that authority and I can't do it. And they started getting into a little bit of, a, a little bit of aggression, you might say. And she says, you have to. And she says, no, I am not going to break the rules. And she says, you must. And she says, no, I will not. And pretty soon they're screaming at each other. And I mean, really <laughs> putting out some energy. And... Um, you know, I was actually backing up, <laughs> moving away. And finally, uh, she broke down, the queen broke down crying and says, no, I cannot do this. And that's when Ruth went over to her, put her arms around her, and spoke to her in her own language and, and uh, tried to calm her down. But it didn't do any good. I mean, she was a queen. She was not going to do what was not right. And, and she was only going to stay in the truth and that was the truth, that she didn't have that authority and she just wasn't going to do it. And so we left there without any permission to do this ceremony. I went back home to my hotel. I remember, I'll never forget this. I sat in there going, oh my God, 13,000 years, millions of people, untold amounts of money spent, 83,000 buildings built all over the world, and uh, many lives were lost uh, doing this whole project. And here we come down to the last few minutes, and two women have a fight, and it's not going to happen? <laughs> I, I just, you know, I just didn't believe it. But it really did look like that's what was going to happen. It looked like it was just not going to go anywhere from there. So we sat around for a couple days, and three or four days, I don't know how long it was, uh, just waiting for something to happen. 
And then, out of the middle of nowhere, we get an invitation from the king of the Polynesian people. His name was Papa Mataru. He was very old. Well, he wasn't that old, but he was in his 80s. And he asked us to come and have a conference with him. Well, this was, uh, this was great because it, uh, it meant that maybe something would happen where we could continue. Because without permission, we can't do this. We can't just run out into somewhere and do this and run away. This requires the Polynesian people to cooperate with us, to do the ceremony with us. We can't do it and they can't do it. it they need the entire world to be there with them and that's who we were representing. And so he asked for a meeting and uh, it was in the afternoon and, we, uh, and I again brought Ruth with me because I knew she could speak uh, the Polynesian language and she understood their ways and everything else. And so uh, we, w we drove to the address they told us, which was, uh, it was his house. And we went into the backyard. And the, in the backyard, there was Papa Mataru in an old white plastic chair on, in the sand. And his family standing all around him, his, his wife, his children, uh, and their children, his grandchildren. They were all sitting around there waiting for us to show up. And they had two chairs sitting there for Ruth and I. So we came in, and with great reverence, we bowed to them and to give them him honor for, for who he was. And he asked us to sit in the chairs. And so uh, we started to introduce ourselves and everything. And while, I, while we were doing that, I noticed that he was squinting like this and trying to see who, who we were. And I realized that he can't see very well. He also couldn't walk very well because you could see his legs were swollen and he had a cane besides, beside his chair that he needed to be able to walk with. And, uh, and so he stopped for a moment and he said, come closer, I have to be able to see you. So I was about 12 feet away from him and so I moved my chair about half the distance and I sat down and looked at him and he still was squinting and squinting and he says, no, you have to come a lot closer. I can't see you. And so I did. I, I moved the chair till I was about that far away from his face. And, uh, and I looked and he says, can you see now? And he says, yes, I can see. And then he goes really quiet and he says nothing. And so I just sat there waiting for him to make uh, the next, next move. And he looked at me and he looked at me and maybe two or three minutes went by. And then suddenly he, a big, uh, his whole face opened up and a smile went on his face. And he, this is a quote. He said, Oh, I remember you. You're from the stars. And he points to the heavens. He says, I have been waiting to meet you all my life. He says, Anything you want, you can have it, whatever it is. And that's, and uh, immediately uh, to uh, not lose the momentum, I said, Well, we would like to go into the middle of the island to do a, cer a world ceremony there. And he says, Absolutely, you can go into the middle of the island. Uh, I'll arrange everything. He says, I'm an old man and I can't walk very well. And I can't walk into the middle of the island. And I really want to be in this ceremony. I feel like I need to be there. He says, would you do it here? Well, there's something I didn't say. Uh, the night before, I had a dream. And I had a dream that uh, if, you, if you can imagine the grid around the earth and that it has a toroidal field, like a magnetic field that goes around it, just like it does to the earth, and it comes around and it goes in. It comes out of the South Pole and it goes into the North Pole. And so it comes out of Morea and it goes into Egypt. And if you think of that, it's like a big tube. It's, it's, it's a vortex and it's hollow. And I, I was wanting to be in the center of the island, but what was made clear in this dream, it didn't matter where you were on the island because the tube that we were needed to be within was bigger than the island. And so we could be anywhere on the island. It didn't really make any difference. And then what happened in the dream right after that, it showed me where the ceremony was going to be. Uh, it was a very specific place. We were in a bay where, where, the, where the bay came back around and you could see the land on the other side. It was a big sandy beach, and there was a, a river that came, an inland river that came out and uh, emptied into the ocean right there with this wall that ran along one side, a, a natural wall. 
and uh, and I could see this. And so uh, the next day, when Ruth and I got together to to drive to see uh, Papa Mataru, uh, we were just talking, and I and I told her about my. I started to tell her my dream, and I got just partly into the dream. And she goes, "I had the same dream." And she finishes the dream. She tells me exactly the same thing, saw the same stuff, and saw the same beach, exactly what it looked like. And I says, wow. I says, I says this must be we're supposed to do this. So uh, Papa Mataru says, I can't go to the center of the island. Uh, would you please do it here at my home so I could be there with you? And we were on the beach, but we couldn't see because there were all these trees that blocked the beach. So Ruth and I jumped up, ran through the trees, and we both got out there and we looked around and we go, oh my God, this is it. And, and w there was no doubt to either one of us, we, this was exactly what we saw in our dream and we knew we were supposed to do it there. So we went back to, to Papa and we said, yes, 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 this is where we do it. And, and he got really happy. He says, oh, I can be there okay. So our next question was, well, you are the king. When does the ceremony take place? Because we didn't know. And he said, tomorrow morning at sunrise. And so it was sealed. It was ready to take place for the first time. And we left and went back to tell all the other people what had happened for, during that day. When I got back there, somebody handed me a letter from Australia. I didn't... Uh, I knew the person, but I hadn't talked to them in many years. But for some reason, they knew I was there and sent me this letter. And so um, I open the letter up, and it informs me that on the next day, the earth, the sun, and the moon would go into a straight line, and there would be a lunar eclipse, uh, at the, which happened to be on the very day that we were doing this uh, ceremony, and that the shadow of the moon would go directly over the island of Morea. I go, wow, that's amazing, because we had not planned this, and I didn't even look into the heavens to think about that on those kind of levels. And so now, uh, when I knew that, and we knew the beach and where it was, I was so certain in my heart that we were doing this exactly the way we were supposed to. The next morning at sunrise, all of us pile out of our bus, we <laughs> squeeze through his backyard and into this beach, and we're all going out into this beach uh, to preparing to do the ceremony. And it was at that moment that I realized I didn't have any idea what I was supposed to do. I didn't know. I was so wrapped up in finding the right place and all these other kinds of things and dealing with the, the, the different energies that was there. It never even occurred to me until I'm five minutes away from actually doing this. I didn't know what to do. I just dropped down in the sand. I put my head down in the sand so I could be alone. And I asked for inner guidance. And all of my training has been through Native American people and, and their understandings. And, and this was different. This was a very interesting uh, ceremony uh, that I had never seen before. And, uh, but I had to go with what I was being told to do. And so I told everyone to go get something from the water, something from the land, and something from the air. And three objects. And so everybody went out. A half an hour later or so, they all came back. And we put these in a sequence of water, earth, air, water, earth, air, all around into my native thing, which was a medicine wheel. It's a circle with a square in the middle for the four directions. The ceremony began to unfold in ways again, that I'd never seen. It was kind of like water or waves coming in, each wave getting stronger and stronger and stronger and then relaxing. And the energy moved in exactly that kind of way. Papa Mataru was sitting on the edge of the circle in his plastic chair because he couldn't sit down on the ground. And he was watching all of this. And finally, the ceremony came to a close and to an end. And what that signified was is that Mother Earth was at that moment giving birth to the consciousness of a new grid. It was crowning. Now, uh, there, there are some things we have to understand in just a moment here. There's a little bit more to this. But the birthing process was beginning. It was just beginning to take place. After it was over with, uh, Papa Mataru called me over to his chair, and I went over to them, and I, I asked him, uh, you know, what did he want? And he pulled me really close 
so that nobody could hear. And he said to me, how did you know to do that ceremony? He says, that ceremony was very precise and we have been keeping that secret for thousands of years. How did you know that? And I, I couldn't answer him. I just gave him a big hug. And for the first time I felt his heart. And I knew then why he was the, <laughs> the king of the Polynesian. I mean, this man had a heart as big as the earth. He was incredibly uh, sensitive to all life everywhere. And I, I understood so much in that moment. We left after that. Our job was done. We had finished what we had to do on that island and we went back to our various places and prepared to leave. Uh, we went back uh, a day or so later uh, to our different countries all over the world, back to different places, many, many different places around the world. And I went, came back here to Sedona, to Arizona. The next morning, uh, one of the people that was in there, uh, Carolina, uh, went up early in the morning of the next morning and took a photograph. An impossible photograph was, was taken. She showed this photograph from about 30 feet away and there was the medicine wheel, the shells and everything on the ground and floating directly above it was a five-pointed star that was a very bright white light that the camera could pick up very, very easily. It was actually more like a five-pointed, like a, like a starfish. These points were rounded. We then got some pictures that were taken three weeks later where people had gone over and the waves had come in and washed it and you could see the objects were scattered all over the place but the star was still floating there three weeks later which was still amazing. And then we got a call from Papa Mataru the following day later. Morea is an island shaped like a heart and around it is a heart-shaped um, coral reef. And in there is some of the cleanest, most beautiful water in the world. And it was filled with, with fish. It looked like it really, really did. It looked like an aquarium. When I was there in 1985, I was spending six hours a day in this water swimming through these fish. And you'd swim right through them. And so when we were there this time, I had two of my children there. And, uh, and I was so excited to bring them into the water to show them all these fish. And I said, oh, you won't believe this. It's so incredible. We got on our fins and our masts. We jump in the water, and there's no fish. You'd see maybe two or three, 30 feet away, and you'd see another two or three over here. But it was just open. They were gone. And, well, according to Papa Mataru, about 15 years ago, they all died. And they just disappeared. Well, the next morning, according to Papa Mataru, the entire bay that we were there, in there, for the first time in 15 years, was filled with these tropical fish. And for him, that was the sign from Mother Earth and from all of their people that what we had done on that day before, that the birthing of the thing, was correct, it was true, and it, was, it had actually taken place. And so uh, I was... <laughs> I was excited, I mean, I, to, to hear this, to see this, and to know this. And uh, so when I got back to Sedona, to here, to these red rocks, uh, and I thought it was, everything was completed. But in my meditations, uh, both with my inner guidance and with Mother Earth, actually, uh, uh, it became clear that there was more to do. I didn't really understand what it was, but it has to do with time. Uh, uh, the timing of a human birth is that it takes about nine months for it to be uh, to grow big enough where it can come out and be born and when it does come out to be born that may take anywhere from a half an hour to an hour or even longer for the baby to come out but this is very similar when this when this consciousness grid is born uh, it, it's similar in the sense of, of, of how life is born, but it takes 13,000 years instead of nine months for it to be born, so there's a big difference in time. And instead of an hour or so to be born, it takes one lunar cycle. It takes uh, 27 point something days for it to, to go all the way from grounding to come out and be totally born. And so they told me I had to do one more ceremony here, uh, which we did not very far away from where we're sitting right now. And what was so interesting in that one, which just completely blew my mind, was we did the ceremony and, and we 
we're finishing up the ceremony and just as we were finishing up the ceremony, the sun, the moon, the earth lined up in a straight line, another lunar eclipse happened and it went right over Sedona and right over exactly where I was sitting. Nobody could have ever planned that. I, it, I just was speechless for, the, for a long time about this. But uh, this is, has nothing to do with human beings. This is planetary. The, these, this is planets and, and suns and stars. And this is much bigger than, than any of us. And, uh, and they move in ways that are precise. And so uh, after that ceremony was done, it was now completed. There is one little piece that I will like to tell you, and then you will understand, I think, how important this is to you, as well as everyone that you know and everyone on this planet. The uh, last thing I would like to say to you has to do with Melchizedek consciousness. What we know is that uh, when, a, when a grid or a planet uh, has this kind of experience where the grid is born uh, prior to the actual birth uh, it could everything could be lost the whole thing could be lost and so if it happens the that race that's on that planet has to start all over again they have to begin from the beginning and go back out and it's not a good thing it could be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years for them to return to that particular moment again but what we also know is that when a grid is born, it's actually become alive, it's connected to the earth and it's functioning, there has never been a single incident in all life everywhere from the beginning of creation until now that it has not gone all the way. And so what we see, that when we see this take place, which took place in February of 2008, that this is, uh, we have made it as a human race. We are going to go on to the next level of consciousness. It's not a maybe anymore. We know for sure. And, uh, and so this is a fantastic moment in, in life for us to, to uh, uh, celebrate, except that most people don't understand it yet. Cosmic time is so slow. Uh, from February 2008 until now means this baby is not two years old. It's about a minute old. It's brand new. And, uh, and so what is about to unfold in the, in the future uh, will come very soon, probably, and according to the Mayans and all the rest of the tribes, this will happen between now and the late in 2015, and nobody knows when. And I don't think anybody knows when, actually. I don't care who they are, because only Mother Earth knows the truth of that situation. But we have made it. And so for you who are watching this, understand that you have made it. Uh, you are going to go to another level of consciousness beyond your wildest dreams. It will happen. And, uh, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for having trust in yourself and believing in yourself and having the courage to continue in spiritual work. Uh, even though against all odds, I know your families have probably tried to stop you and everything else because it doesn't make sense in, in the normal world. But thank you so much for everything that you have done in your life to bring this into reality. And uh, all of us, we're going to be together on another level of existence very soon, and at which point we'll, we will meet in another way. So thank you from my heart to your heart. Thank you for your lives, and thank you for everything that you've done in your lives.